Good morning. Good. Everybody can hear me. Um, my name is Zara Kimpton. I'm, um, an on I'm the National Vice President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to welcome you all here today on uh, this year's national conference, which is on the subject of foreign policy priorities for a top 20 nation. Unfortunately, the Honourable Julie Bishop, Minister of Foreign Affairs, is unable to attend today's conference due to a new national security uh, meeting. But we're very pleased that um, her Parliamentary Secretary, uh, Senator the Honourable Brett Mason, will deliver the prepared speech on her behalf. Uh, Prime Minister Abbott had originally asked Minister Bishop to represent him at this conference. So on this occasion, Senator Mason will be, we'll be delivering the speech on behalf of both the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister. Um, while organising today's conference, we have received strong support from both the Prime Minister and Ms. Minister Abbott, and they both sent their best wishes for a most successful and constructive 2014 conference. Um, we'll also welcome in this first session the Honourable Richard Miles, Shadow Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, um, and Senator Scott Ludlam from the Australian Greens regretted that he was unable to accept our invitation to be here today. Uh, we're also wel are delighted to welcome um, uh, the ambassadors and high commissioners from 10 different countries, um, many of whom attended this conference last year. Uh, we also welcome all those who contributed to today's session. We're grateful for the time they've spent in travelling and preparing for today's conference. Um, the AAAA is fortunate to receive an annual grant from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, including for this conference, and we're pleased that a number of representatives from the Public Diplomacy and Strategic Planning Divisions are with us today. And of course we mustn't forget our members. The AAAA is the only membership-based organisation in our field with branches in all state capitals, capitals and the ACT. We currently have 1,400 members and I'm pleased to see that every branch is represented in today's audience. This conference follows the most successful inaugural event which was held yesterday afternoon at our national headquarters in Canberra. This was a masterclass series where six of our honorary fellows spent time with about 50 of our younger members from all over the country. These younger members are here today and we welcome the contribution which will be made by some of our future decision makers. I'm sure they'll have plenty of probing questions for our speakers. These classes could not have happened without the expertise of our fellows, and we welcome those who generously gave their time yesterday. They are joined today by some of our other fellows, um, several of whom will be presented with their awards during this, uh, this morning. Um, also, later in the day, one of our Victorian members, Ewan Crone, will announce the name of four recipients of the 2014 Ewan Crone Asian Awareness Scholarships. These awards for younger members of the AAA from across the country were instigated by Ewan last year following his attendance on several AAAV study tours to Asia. Ewan was inspired to create a fund to support these scholarships with a personal donation of $250,000. Ewan is really making a difference in the lives of young Australians who wish to contribute to Australia's engagement with the Asian region and I would particularly like to welcome him here today. There is one point I'd like to clarify about today's conference. Um, many of you will recall that last year we had our 80th anniversary conference. This marked the date of our creation as an, an Australian multi-branch institute in 1933. There's been some reference to 2014 being our 90th anniversary and this conference reflecting that fact, which has led to some confusion. In fact, any reference to the Big 9-0 refers to the fact that the New South Wales branch of Chatham House was created in 1924. And we congratulate AAA New South Wales on this milestone. Uh, the Victorian branch was created just six months later in 1925. Although a separate entity since 1933, AAA has valued its ties with the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, Chatham House, over the intervening years, as well as with other sister institutes from around the world. Today's conference, which we are hoping will now become an annual event, will bring together experts and representatives from government, academia, business and the media, who will focus on the issues which affect Australia. I said last year that we live in interesting times. They just seem to get more interesting. The black swans abound. We're now faced with the repercussions of the downing of MX-17, 
with the loss of 38 citizens or permanent residents, the ongoing instability in Ukraine, the challenges posted by Islamic State, and now the possible spread of the Ebola virus from Africa to the west of the world. 2014 has been a busy year for, Australia's chairman, for Australia with the chairmanship of the G20, the second and final year of our seat on the UN Security Council, our chairmanship of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, and ongoing important trade negotiations on several fronts. We will hear about these issues and many more during the course of this conference with the four sessions concentrating each on foreign policy, enhancing prosperity, strengthening security, and finally, contributing to global issues. For your information, today's event will not be held under the Chatham House rule, so the proceedings will be recorded and broadcast. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker in the session on Australian foreign policy. Senator Brett Mason is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and a Liberal Party Senator for Queensland. In the past, he's held various positions in the shadow education portfolio with a particular responsibility for universities and research. And before entering Parliament, lectured in criminology at QUT and served as a Commonwealth prosecutor. So please welcome Senator Brett Mason. Zara, thank you for that uh, warm welcome uh, and good morning to everyone to uh, John McCarthy, the uh, National President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. He's not here yet, but um, I'll welcome him anyway my distinguished colleague Richard Miles, the Shadow Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, and also the many ambassadors, high commissioners, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a distinct pleasure to, to be with you this morning, uh, giving this keynote address on behalf of Julie Bishop, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and also officially representing the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Zara, this is my first and perhaps my last opportunity to represent them both, so uh, I'll, I'll make the most of it. Um, for 90 years, the Institute has been stimulating debate about international affairs within the Australian community, and it's a very important public service indeed. Throughout Australia's history, uh, our prosperity and our geographic isolation have sometimes created the temptation to dismiss the world beyond our shores as largely irrelevant to our national well-being. In his 1958 essay, The Prodigal Son, Australia's only Nobel laureate for literature, Patrick White, wrote of the great Australian emptiness in which beautiful youths and girls stare at life through blind blue eyes. This is no longer the case. When Australians look at the world, their stare is no longer blind. Australia is now more prosperous than it's ever been before in its history, and also less isolated than it's ever been. Far from the tyranny of distance, we are now exposed to the tyranny of proximity. No threat, no threat and no opportunity, however remote it might seem, is without some resonance and relevance for our country. That's why I'd like to pay special tribute to the Institute and thank you for the essential work you do educating and indeed engaging Australians in debate about the world and Australia's place in it. And our place in the world is as this conference theme suggests, as a top 20 nation. Julie Bishop tells me it's a term she coined and has been frequently using since she became Foreign Minister a little over a year ago. She firmly believed that Australia's tendency to be modest, to be modest about our achievements, doesn't always work to our advantage, that sometimes we need to tell the world how good we are. Julie told me last week, when we were discussing this conference, she said, Brett, I'm tired of hearing people say that Australia punches above our weight. In reality, she said, we carry significant weight and we punch in line with it. We're not a middle power, 
a term which gives the impression of sitting somewhere in the middle of the 193 nations that make up the United Nations. Our influence, our economic and our political influence, is so much more than that. Despite our relatively small population, on almost, on almost any measure you care to name, Australia is well within the top 20 nations of the world. Our membership of the G20 is the most visible sign of that, but far from being the only one. Our economy is the 12th largest on earth and the fourth biggest in Asia. We're the fifth wealthiest nation on earth based on GDP per capita. Our currency is the fifth most traded. And we are second in the world, uh, behind only Norway, in the United Nations Human Development Index. In some areas, in some areas, agriculture, natural resources, education, I believe we are actually a superpower. For head of population, we educate more international students than any other country on earth, by far. Our university system is the third strongest in the world, behind only the United States and the United Kingdom. We should be immensely proud of these achievements, but they also bring with them a serious responsibility to play our part in building and maintaining global security. A top 20 nation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has to play a top 20 role. We've always taken our responsibility seriously from the battlefields of three continents, defending our values, to the meeting rooms of the League of Nations and then the United Nations, both of which we helped to found, and Australia continues to do so. As Zara mentioned in her opening comments before, the 2014 has been a big year for Australian diplomacy, with the UN Security Council, G20, the Indian Ocean Rim Association. In each of these forums, we took the opportunity as a chair or a member to shape the global agenda and to encourage our international partners to work together towards greater regional and, and global peace and prosperity. It's in the United Nations Security Council, particularly, that Australia shone brightly on the world stage. Our foreign minister was thrown head, head first uh, into the deep end of the pool, I'm afraid, uh, virtually the first thing that Julie Bishop did after being appointed foreign minister was to jump on the plane to New York to chair the Security Council. Of course, she performed with great distinction, ably assisted by our terrific foreign service. And she has set the pace and the standard for Australia's exercise of influence and championing Australian values right throughout the international arena. Perhaps, perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as a quiet year in world affairs. But 2014 seems to have been particularly challenging from Syria to North Korea, from Iraq to Afghanistan, from the natural plague of Ebola to the man-made the man plague of extremist terrorist groups like Islamic State and Boko Haram, and all the way to Ukraine, the Crimean crisis, the instability and the shocking loss of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 in the skies above Ukraine, truly we have had our hands full. Considering that None of these challenges have easy fixes. I believe that Australia has served its term on the Council with great merit, doing what we do best, working hard to build an international consensus and focusing on security, human rights and effective peacekeeping and humanitarian responses. All that, all that while promoting our values, serving our national interests, and enhancing our international reputation. Nothing, nothing, ladies and gentlemen, demonstrates our skills in effective crisis response better than Australia's leadership in the days and the weeks immediately after the downing of MH17 in eastern Ukraine. We moved swiftly to demand justice was done for the 209 people on board, including those 38 that called Australia home, who were so shockingly murdered. The plane went down. The plane went down on Thursday. We moved immediately 
and successfully to secure access to the crash site. By Friday, our diplomats in New York had drafted a resolution and it was circulated to other members on the Security Council on Saturday. Negotiations began on Sunday and by Monday, every one of the 15 mem members of the Security Council was on board, including Russia. Without Australia's diplomatic effort, the Council's resolution 2166 calling for a full and thorough investigation of the MH17 atrocity would never have been adopted and the matter would not have received the international attention it needed and indeed it deserved. This is just one example of Australian diplomacy at its finest, but it's far from the only one. Take our work. Take our work to ensure the delivery of humanitarian assistance to the innocent victims of the Syrian conflict, starting with Resolution 2139, which we co-authored with Jordan and with Luxembourg. Take our work in drafting the Council's first ever resolution, number 2117, regarding illicit trade in small arms and in light weapons. Take our work to protect peacekeepers, including securing the release of Fijian peacekeepers who had been taken prisoner by Jabhat al-Nasra in the Golan Heights. Or take our work to ensure the outcomes of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea resonated internationally and were reflected in the work of the Security Council. In all these instances, our actions reflected our values and our national interest, as they should, and our concern for peace, stability and prosperity around the world, as they must, but also our regional perspective and our desire to tackle strongly and directly issues affecting our region's stability and our region's well-being. This was our commitment to our friends and to our neighbours right throughout the region who have entrusted us to represent their concerns on the, on the Security Council. And I believe we very proudly kept that. But uh, the job is not over yet. At the end of this week, Australia will again have the privilege of assuming the presidency of the Security Council. It's a pretty good way to spend the penultimate month of our two-year term, and we've got big plans. First among them is continuing to fight the scourge of terrorism, and specifically tackling one of its nastiest offshoots, the phenomenon of foreign fighters, who are a threat not only, not only to fragile, war-torn parts of the world, but also in our own backyards, here, back home. So we'll use our second presidency to bring the international community together to examine ways we can counter violent extremism, radicalisation, as well as recruitment. We will also host the first ever dedicated council session and resolution on policing issues, particularly to highlight the role that police increasingly play in peacekeeping and, and in peace building. It's an area where, as a nation, we have a recognised track record, including right throughout our region. We'll also work to improve the United Nations sanctions regimes to make them even more efficient and effective instruments of international policy. To this end, we've been working with Finland, Greece and Sweden on a comprehensive review of existing sanctions. And this work will underpin the proposals we will take to the Council next month. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no doubt that Australia's term on the Security Council has paid long-term dividends, both in terms of an immediate impact on issues like MH17 and Syria, but also in, in, also in less tangible ways. We have worked to further our values, values of peace and prosperity, democracy and human rights, protection of the weak and the vulnerable, and the right of all people to live their lives in peace, free from extremist ideology and practice. And we have not only strengthened our existing friendships, we've done that, and those alliances, but we've also raised our profile and our influence with countries where Australia perhaps, perhaps isn't always front of mind. As I said at the outset, 
Australians often underestimate our own importance and the impact that we can have on the world. Our recent experience on the Security Council suggests we do so at our peril. What we do matters. We are a top 20 nation. Others around the world know it. Thank you so much for all your work, ladies and gentlemen, to help Australians recognise and indeed celebrate that achievement. Thank you. Can you hear me? Right. Um, thank you very much, Senator Mason. Um, that we appreciate your coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, I'd now like to welcome our next speaker, who is our national president, um, John McCarthy. John has been one of our most distinguished diplomats, um, serving most recently uh, as High Commissioner in India, and before that he was an ambassador in Japan, Indonesia, and the United States. Uh, he's also had appointments in, uh, as ambassador in Thailand, Mexico and Vietnam. Um, other uh, positions that he's held over recent years as Chair of the Australia India Council, Deputy Chair of the Australia India Institute, Chair of the Advisory Board of Griffith, Griffith Asia Institute and Co-Convener of the Australia Indonesia Dialogue. Welcome, John. Well, thank you very much, Zara, and uh, thank you, Senator Mason, for uh, coming along. And thank you all in the audience uh, for coming to this second event, which we hope will be a series of annual events, which really focus on Australian foreign policy as a whole, uh, where we can uh, discuss uh, openly where we think this country is at. The definition is, I think, as, as wide as that. Um, I'm just going to give you uh, a few reflections which have been on my mind for a few months uh, in the hope that it will stimulate uh, some debate and discussion. And I very much look forward to hearing my friend Hugh also talk uh, on essentially what is happening in the Australian environment. Uh, let me start by just mentioning that Three, to go, three days ago I was in, in London and I was having lunch with uh, an old Japanese friend who used to work very closely with Prime Minister Koizumi, somebody you would call probably uh, to the centre, perhaps centre-right of the Japanese political spectrum, and with two uh, British foreign policy journalists. Uh, the discussion got on to uh, David Cameron's travails in London. Anybody who's been in the UK recently would understand the sort of pressures that are on that Prime Minister. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about uh, what he was facing on the foreign policy front, including the Ukraine, including Syria, uh, including obviously what has been happening recently in Iraq. And we talked also of what was happening in Northeast Asia. And the comment was made by one of the British journalists that, you know, the British really are moving away from the closeness of their alliance with the United States. There are too many other issues, there are too many other pressures on them. Uh, the EU issue for one, Scotland for another. Uh, they alluded to debates in the parliament about deployment into Syria and the more recent debate in the British parliament about deployment into Iraq. In all these cases, Cameron was having to negotiate with the people's representatives about what British foreign policy should be. And they looked over and they said, uh, by contrast, Australia has now become the closest ally by far to the United States. 
Uh, and the suggestion was, perhaps, that it was so close that we had very little room for manoeuvre. And these comments were made by, by both Brits and the Japanese at a lunch. And it made me reflect. It's not the first time I've heard this comment, but it's the first time it's been put to me by really serious thinkers about the international environment. And I have to say, it didn't make me feel very comfortable. And I'll come back to that. That afternoon, I took myself for a bit of a walk and I reflected on what that sort of conversation might have, uh, how that sort of conversation might have taken place 20 years ago, taking us back to 1994, at a time when I was our representative in Thailand. And had we had a conversation then about where Australia sat in the world, the conversation would overwhelmingly have been about our embrace of Asia, about a series of policies that had been put into place in the previous decade, which really meant that Asians took us seriously as a part of that world. In particular, you look at the role Hawke played in the formation of APEC. You have a look at the role that Keating played in enlarging APEC to a summit. You look at the work that Gareth Evans did, and inter interestingly enough, Miles Cooper, who was working at that time, uh, is here today, on, in terms of Gareth's paper on Australia's role in the region. It's called Comprehensive Security. Nothing like it has been done since then, where it really set out where Asia sat in terms of the Australian foreign policy spectrum. It was the time when Keating really made a push into Indonesia. And it was really a very, very active time. It was also the time that Gareth Evans put together a construct for the Cambodian peace settlement. We were really very active on Asia, and we were regarded as such, and we were regarded as a player. And that brings me to the next comment, and it's this that if you were asked today what is the defining feature of Australian foreign policy, my strong sense is that the response you would get from leading interlocutors almost anywhere in the world is the proximity or the closeness of the United States alliance. Uh, I, I, I sense that almost uh, without any reservation. And it wouldn't matter whether you talked with people in Europe or Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia. And that, I think, makes a very, very major sea change in the way we are now looking at the world as compared with the way we looked at the world 20 years ago. Now, what happened? First off, I think quite clearly, the fact that in 2001, 9-11 occurred, which resulted in our involvement in two wars in the Middle East, and which was the prime mover, really, which led, and has led, to our involvement in a third war in the Middle East. Wars which have been primarily, uh, which, in, in which we became involved primarily because of our relationship with the United States. Although the more recent intervention, which we are making in Iraq, you can argue was prompted by factors a little bit wider than our relationship with the United States. But again, all this has added up to a global perception of where Australia sees itself in the world. At least, that is my submission. Now, were I to say this to many members of the Australian foreign policy establishment, of which I once belonged, 
were I to say this to members of either political party, I know that I would immediately uh, be subject to a series of rebuttals. I would be told, look at our trade relationship. Look at the fact that we have either concluded or are likely to conclude bilateral trade agreements with countries like China, Japan, and India. I would be referred to the work we did in the construction of the East Asia Summit, although many more countries than just Australia were involved in that exercise. I would be referred, as one always is, when discussing our relations with any country, to the number of two-way ministerial visits. This is always used as a yardstick for the quality of the relationship, with little reference often being made to the content of those visits. But those are the sorts of responses I would get, and I would be told, and nobody would be seeking to mislead me, I would be told with a totally genuine approach from our interlocutors, or my interlocutor, that, you know, how can you be right? Look at what we have done. I would then have to come back and say, what are the arguments of the way, in favour of the way which we lost sight of our goal as a nation? And it's one of these situations where you either get it or you don't. It's kind of hard to explain, but I'm going to make some sort of an effort, and I would mention that I had uh, conversations in the last 24 hours with a couple of colleagues who spent many, many years in Asia. The first comment, I think, is that if you have been the host of numerous visits by Australian political po politicians to Asia, carrying good briefs with a lot of goodwill, you get the strong sense that there is some intellectual understanding of the importance of Asia, but there is not the energy and commitment to that relationship which is necessary. It is far, far easier for a member of the Australian political class to go to Washington to be flattered by people who are an enormously significant people, but with a capacity for flattering smaller nations, which is really quite astonishing. And our politicians go, they spend a couple of days, they are overwhelmed and they come back. And it is also, of course, immensely to talk to New Zealanders, to Canadians, to British, than it is to try and get involved in the depths of the political scene in Jakarta, let alone sitting, going through interpreters with a group of very senior Chinese. It is just tougher, and it is tougher for people who belong essentially to an Anglo-Saxon Western tradition and a political environment which is totally different to that of our closer neighbours. There are exceptions to this. The biggest exception I say to this room is probably that I've dealt with is Gareth Evans, who really did seek to uh, get a grasp of what was happening in Asia, and did it with considerable effect, although his style would not always have been what you might call the ASEAN way of doing business. But he really did get a grasp of it. And there are others too. But the mainstream sense you get from the Australian political class embracing Asia is that they get it intellectually, but they don't get it emotionally. The other point is this. Our political style, I've said this time and time again, as a Western democratic country, whose countries of primary foreign policy focus are simply different to ours, often does not work. And that is because the Australian political style of a lot of noise, a lot of abuse, a lot of immediate reactions to events does not sit well when it looks when it's at the end of a ticker tape or a computer in Asia. And the misunderstandings that you have because of that particular possibility or that particular uh, way, of, way of doing things uh, are really manifold. Um, Another point, 
Our partisan politics here really gets absurd if you're in a foreign policy setting. It's better now than it was a year ago. But it is really absurd. The white paper that was done on Asia was a genuine effort to try and get some sensible material on Asia. It was a genuine effort to try and rejuvenate thinking in Australia on Asia. It was a genuine effort to try and get some worthwhile policies going. Of course, there was lots of political ducks and drakes going on. 18 ministers in the former government took credit for parts of it. Uh, by the time the politicians had played around with it, it bore no resemblance to what it was supposed to be. And of course, the opposition really damned it with fake praise because it wasn't theirs. But, you know, there was a lot of very useful work in that, and it was put in not so much by government servants, but by members of the Australian community, right across the board from the NGOs to the centre, to the left, to business, to the centre, to the right. And yet it was ignored. It was ignored because of partisan politics. And, and, and that's damaging, and it's silly. And it shows what's wrong with our approach. One government said, it's all great, we're not going to give you any money. The other government just ignored it. It's gone. It wasn't ours, so it's irrelevant. OK. The other point that worries me is this reference we get occasionally to the Anglosphere. The Anglosphere actually goes back to Cecil Rhodes, but that's a bit odd. That's, that's a bit crazy. But lately it's, got, it's been revived as a concept. And it's been revived as a concept, I think, partly because of the military exercises in the Middle East where Anglo-Saxon countries or countries of Anglo-Saxon origin have been fighting together, but also because of the intelligence uh, establishments linkage with the five eyes. And uh, you sometimes get the sense in this country that that is actually more important than the purposes which it is supposed to serve. And the classic example of that was the Indonesian farce of a year ago, where uh, you know, a lot of people who thought they were very smart uh, decided to, as we all know, uh, spy on the on Indonesian leadership. Now, in seeking to resolve that, it was clear by the approach that we took that the fact that that Five Eyes establishment was sacrosanct was more important than the relationship with Indonesia with which, which that particular set of tools is actually supposed to enhance. And again, I think none of that has been lost. Finally, and I don't want to get onto the refugees issue, uh, because it's complicated and it's detailed and it's a debate in itself. The one point I want to make here is not only is because of the way we have handled this refugees issue, and by the way, by the way we handle ordinary visas coming to this country, we give the impression to the outside that we are an unfriendly, unwelcoming, frightened country. And that's not good, that's not embracing Asia. Okay. So if I want to say anything, my first point is this, is that we have lost our way on Asia. The second point I want to make is this, and I leave this subject more to my friend Hugh. In terms of our dealing within Asia, the impression that we have quite obviously created by the first set of propositions that I've made, the importance of the alliance, is that we think Asia is less important than our relationship with the United States. That is the impression it gives. Everything is about impressions. And that is the impression it gives. Now, this issue of the alliance, it's not straightforward. It's not clear. The relationship with Japan and India actually probably benefits from the fact that we have a strong security relationship with the United States because it suits their policies. I think at the same time uh, there is a certain curiosity as to why there is absolutely no light between our position on security issues and on American positions on security issues. Both the Japanese 
and the Indians, of course, who are not allies, have considerable light between their positions on security issues and American positions on security issues. So they're probably curious, but it doesn't worry them because it's, it's basically in their overall interest. My sense of China, and there are people here who are much more expert than I am on this, is that Australia is of major importance to them because of resources. And if, we, uh, if they hear our political bay, which passes for political discourse in this country, about them, I think they probably ignore it as something which, provided it doesn't get excessive, they, they basically accept, they ignore it. I might be being a little bit uncharitable towards ourselves, but that's my sense of it. Uh, it might, however, get excessive, and they might, at some stage, take a different view. I don't, by the way, suggest we should be pleasing the Chinese on everything we do, not at all. But what we need to do, I think, is have a policy which is based on Australian interests. And if you turn to the second page of Financial Review, Australian Financial Review, you will see a very interesting set of comments about the way we are approaching this Beijing-sponsored uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's very curious if we do avoid going into that particular bank for political reasons. And the way that article reads uh, strongly suggests that this, at least for the moment, is our position. So again, it's Australian interests. Now where does this harm us? I think in a changing world, and Asia is changing, if we are not seen for speaking, as speaking for ourselves on security issues, people will not listen. They will see us possibly unhappily, correctly, as an American satrap. And that American satrap, an American satrap does not speak independently. And any views we might have will simply be discounted. And finally, and here again I revert to the Middle East, and that again is a subject on its own. And I don't really want to get into the those arguments, because that would take another 15 minutes. But one thing about the amount of political energy we put into those issues is that it detracts from what we can do in this region. No country has unlimited foreign policy or political energy. A lot is beginning to happen in Southeast Asia. We've had a new government in Indonesia. There are problems in Thailand that are unresolved. There are problems in other parts of Southeast Asia that are also unresolved. We have to deal with Southeast Asians on major security issues, how we are indeed going to cope with the rise of China. And our propensity, our capacity to do all this is derogated from if we continue to be seen as a satrap. Okay, that's enough. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, and now our next speaker is um, Professor Hugh White, who's a fellow of uh, this institute. Uh, Hugh is Professor of Strategic Studies at the Australian National University, where his work focuses particularly on Australian strategic and defence policy, um, also Asia-Pacific security issues and global strategic affairs as they influence Australia and the Asia-Pacific. He was the first director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Welcome. Well, uh, thanks, Sarah. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Nice to see a few old friends in the audience. Well, big subject, of course, not much time. I'll go fast and be very, well, I'll just focus on a couple of issues. Setting priorities, of course, is always hard. It touches on a point that John just made. And there's always lots of interesting things happening out there. Uh, as uh, as uh, uh, Senator Mason said, there's lots of interesting things happening. The United, Australia's role in the UN Security Council, our role in the G20, 
the tragedy of MH17, even a significant challenge to regional and to a certain extent even global order posed by current developments in the Middle East. Uh, these, are, these are significant issues for Australia, but in the end we do have to set priorities. And if we think about Australia's foreign policy, the key question we've got to start with by asking is which of the issues that we face will do most to shape Australia's future. And it is worth bearing in mind that foreign policy is serious in the end, because sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes in countries' histories, the way we conduct our foreign policy shapes the whole future of the country. It, because it shapes the way the international setting in which we function, we or any other country, in which we function, and the extent to which we can realise our basic national objectives of prosperity and security. We in Australia are not used to thinking of foreign policy in these terms, because for quite a long time, for about 40 years, we haven't had to, because for 40 years, roughly speaking, Australia's international setting has been extremely stable and extremely congenial. It's been very easy for us to build a stable, secure, prosperous society on this continent over the last 40 years because the international setting has worked, worked so well for us. And we've got out of the habit of thinking what we need to do to make sure that that setting remains so stable. We've got complacent. Now these thoughts um, are partly prompted by Gough Whitlam's death last week. Big subject, very ambiguous character, made lots of mistakes, got a few things right. And as much as anything, huge achievements obviously domestically, but as much as anything, what Whitlam got right was China and the visit to China. Whitlam's approach to China helped to shape, fundamentally shape Australia's place in the world fundamentally shaped the kind of place in the world that we have today and more broadly contributed in significant ways to shaping the way the whole of Asia evolved. We've got very used to thinking of the way Asia in fact evolved after the Vietnam War. It could have evolved in lots of different ways. There might not have been an opening between America and China. America might not have stayed engaged in Asia. There are very strong reasons to think that both of those were real possibilities. In fact, they didn't happen. In fact, America stayed engaged in a close relationship with China, which provided the foundations for so much which has happened. And Whitlam contributed to that. And he contributed to that, first of all, because he, of course, living and working through the 50s and 60s, where Australia did not take its international setting for granted, placed foreign policy at the heart of his national leadership. And because he brought to that task real imagination and energy and courage. And I would say that today, again in Asia, we face fundamental changes in the way Asia works, which do threaten the kind of order that we'll see, that do threaten our confidence that we, our international setting will allow Australia to live in the security and the prosperity that we so readily now, after 40 years, take for granted. And that uh, our failure, the failure of our national foreign policy system, community, whatever, to engage in that is a major failure of national politics and policy. The heart of that big subject in itself, the heart of that is, of course, the fundamental shift in the distribution of wealth and power in Asia occasioned by the rise of China uh, and other countries. But China, let's not kid ourselves, is the biggest story that all the others put together. This is a fundamental redistribution of wealth and power and therefore a fundamental shift in the foundations of the Asian order. And for us to imagine that Asia keeps on working for the next 40 years the way it has in the last 40 years in the light of that shift is, well, heroically optimistic is a polite word for it. But that is precisely the assumption that underlies the foreign policy both of the government and of the opposition in Australia today. The, the, the assumption underlying it is that Asia can be transformed economically and untouched, unaffected strategically and politically, that US primacy can remain the foundation of the Asian order for as far ahead as we can see.
And that orthodoxy is expressed in a phrase which I am as confident as I am of anything will come to be seen as a real quintessence of folly. We don't have to choose. We don't have to choose between America and China. So let me spend a couple of minutes on that. Well, first point, because we don't want to choose. Oh, that's right. We don't want to choose between America and China. In fact, we don't have a secure, prosperous future if we are forced to make any kind of stark choice between America and China. But we don't want to choose. Agree with that. Whether we have to choose depends, of course, a bit on what we mean by choice. And to slightly oversimplify, you can put it into two categories. So the big choices and the small choices. The big choice is the idea of a fundamental binary choice, the sort of choice we actually made in 1949, you might say. We go with America and abandon China, or we go with China and abandon America. No, we don't have to make that choice now, yet, though I'll come back to that. But the other choice we need, we need to think about are the small choices, the choices that governments, countries make all the time, where do we do what they want, or do we do what they want? Do we give them a preference or do we give them preference? That kind of choice, the small, tactical, but cumulative and collectively very significant choices about how we balance between two competing powers, we make those choices all the time. And we're making more of them as every year passes and they're becoming more significant as every year passes and they're doing more and more to condition the circumstance under which we might or might not have to make that big choice in the not too distant future. Now, that's happening because the US and China have increasingly become strategic rivals. We haven't had to choose because the US and China have not seen one another as rivals, actually strategically, economically, or any other significant way. That ends. That ended, I think the historians will judge, from China's point of view, somewhere around about 2008 or 2009, where China started very clearly pushing for what Xi Jinping calls a new model of great power relations. And let's be clear, when he says a new model of great power relations, he means he doesn't like the old one. He means he doesn't accept an Asian border based on US privacy. And that's new. And from America's side, the year of escalating strategic rivalry, I think, will be, will be dated from 2011. In fact, from November 2011. In fact, from the speech that Barack Obama gave in our parliament, announcing the pivot announcing America's intention to use every element of American power to preserve the status quo, the status quo that China rejects, quite unambiguously rejects. And in particular, since that has happened, Australia has more and more faced small choices, they're not actually that small, small choices between the US and China all the time. The AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank choice, which John referred to, is, a, is, is right now a very current, very interesting, quite resonant example of this. But there are lots of others. In fact, it's happening all the time because in the last few years, a new and very important diplomatic reality has emerged for Australia. In every field except economics, and of course that's a pretty big exception, but in every field except economics, strategically and politically in particular, Australia is seen by the US and China primarily in relation to the other. That is, they, 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 both of those two great countries see Australia, see their relations with Australia, manage their relations with Australia primarily in terms of where Australia sits in the escalating strategic rivalry with the other. We have become a pawn in their rivalry. And that's a very dangerous place to be. It's worth making the point that the, the, the smaller choices we're making are not just the sort of straight binary ones between the US and China because there are more than two players in the region. The choices we're making about Japan are equally significant. One of the most remarkable things about the present government's foreign policy has been, the, been its approach to, to developing strategic relationships with Japan. I think that approach is full of error. It's not because it's, I don't think it's a wrong or a bad idea because China doesn't like it. I certainly don't think it's a bad idea because I don't think Japan should be secure and that we need to contribute to a regional order in which Japan can be secure. 
I think it's a bad idea because the approach that the Abe government is taking, which the Abe government is so strongly supporting, is not going to deliver a secure future for Japan. It's also not going to deliver a secure future for Asia. It's not in Japan's or Australia's or Asia's interests. We are making choices to support something which is not going to work for them or for us. And that just does touch on the broader point. That is that the choices that we make, these small choices, are important, not just in themselves, they are quite important, things like the AIIB, things like Marines in Darwin. These are important issues in themselves. But they matter because they frame the way the whole, they, th these are the bricks from which the new Asian order emerges. Little choices by us, by others. But we shouldn't underestimate the importance of our choices. After all, it's not just the government, it's also the opposition that keeps telling us that we're a terrifically important and significant country and that what we say and do really counts in the world. We don't act as if we really believe that when we think about what we, the way we conduct ourselves in relation to Asia. I think, at least to that extent, they're right. What we do does matter. And because we don't, as a country, because as a foreign policy community, we're pretending we're not making these choices. We're not making them well. And indeed, I think both government and opposition don't want to identify the choices we're making, don't want to explore and explain and choose carefully about the choices we're making because they don't want to address the underlying tough realities that have to be faced. Now, that's not what Whitlam did. When Whitlam went to China, and of course the visit to China was the culmination of a long and very focused and energetic process of policy development, he was making a choice a very difficult and politically courageous choice. A choice which in retrospect was of course 100% right. In fact, was vindicated within days of his visit by the fact that, that Kissinger was there at the same time. But that kind of choice, well, I don't think Whitlam would have said we don't have to choose. And neither, to be fair to the other side of politics, did liberal politicians like Gordon and Fraser think we don't have to choose. These people were really engaged in what was happening in the Asia of their day and were willing to take the debate to the Australian public, explain the choices we face and make them intelligently. And, we, and the Australia we live in owes a lot to the way in which they did that because the Asia we live in owes a lot to the way we did that. And that brings me finally and very briefly to the big choice. Because it is of course entirely possible, entirely possible, not inevitable, but entirely possible that Australia will face the big choice at some stage. Anyone who thinks that escalating rivalry between the United States and China could not produce a situation in which Australia finds it impossible to maintain both relations as they exist today hasn't been paying attention to how dangerous Asia has become. And we must do what we can to reduce that likelihood, to reduce that risk. Um, if we don't want to be forced to make a big choice between America and China, we must do whatever we can to reduce escalating strategic rivalry, to contribute to the emergence of a new US-China relationship, which will not look like the old one, but which could provide a basis for them to step back from the escalating rivalry of recent years and find a new way to live in peace. Nothing is more important to Australia's future than that that succeeds. Because if we fail, we will have to make that big choice. And don't rely on the United States to get it right. Uh, I have great respect for the United States, of the traditions of the United States statecraft. And it was, after all, US statecraft, amongst others, that delivered the stable order of the last 40 years. But no one who talks to Americans about the future of their relationship with China can but be struck by the fact that America does not know how to respond. They're not getting this right. And I understand why they're not getting it right, because it's very difficult for them. But boy, if Australia just sits back and assumes that the Americans are going to get this right, we'll be making a heroic and historic error. We have to think this through for ourselves. We have to do what we can to shape the region ourselves, we have to work with other countries in Asia as well as the United States and China to shape a new order in Asia which limits the risk of escalating rivalry and enhances our chances of security and prosperity 
there could be no higher priority for our diplomacy. No higher priority. Nothing that's happened in the Security Council while we've been there is nearly as important to Australia as this. Nothing that will happen in the G20 is nearly as important as this. Not that they're not important, they're just not as important as the big one. There is no higher challenge to our diplomacy today, to our foreign policy today. I think you could argue there's been no bigger challenge to our foreign policy in our history than to find a way to shape the Asian order to make sure we don't have to make those choices. And there'll be no bigger failure if we get it wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Now we have 15 minutes um, in which uh, both Hugh and John will take questions um, at the same time. So, uh, well, I mean that the, the session is, you can choose uh, if you'd like to ask, um, put your question to, to one or other of them, or perhaps to both and they, they both reply. Um, could I please have hands, now do we have a rowing microphone? Uh, right. And, here, we have the first one here, please, Richard Rinoski. Um, if you could say, state your name and any relevant affiliation. Thank you. Um, Richard Rinoski, President of uh, New South Wales uh, Chapter of AAA. This morning, we've heard two, I hope, speeches that might, in fact, have a, a resonance and influence on the way both the government and the opposition react to the world situation in the future. And it's a pity that the, the, the chap who was representing Senator Brett Mason couldn't stay to hear it. I hope that he gets a full record. My comment, observation if I may to both speakers, is that this relationship with China is becoming more stringent, more difficult. There's a recent report from the Foreign Correspondence Club in Beijing that shows that the Chinese are giving shorter and shorter shrift to the normally more liberal uh, allowances that they gave to foreign correspondents in China. They're restricting them in all sorts of respects in all sorts of regions. We have a very small project there to send the best and brightest of our junior of, of students in media to, to study and to work as interns in Beijing media. And this is the second year it's coming up. Thank goodness they're still allowing us in. But the way we are being treated, and the Chinese are very subtle about this, the way we're being treated in all sorts of respect, as are American uh, statesmen who go there, is a, a clear message that the Chinese are not going to tolerate much longer the assumption that we make, and that the Americans make, that they call the shots in Asia. So I just want to congratulate both, both speakers and say it's, it's well thought out, it's visceral, it's important, and let's hope that the Australian government and opposition get some resonance from this. Thank you. So Richard, is that really a comment rather than a question? Comment rather than question. <laughs> okay, thank no, you very much. No, a question, of course, not a comment. No, you yes. not to if, if right. any... The next question, Miles Cooper. Miles Cooper, until recently with our Foreign Service. Um, I'd like to endorse what John McCarthy said about how we're seen regionally and globally, and also his point about how while our senior political leaders might get it intellectually about Asia, um, by instinct they don't, that's the way I'd put it. Um, I think there's a couple of factors, uh, I've got a comment and a question, a couple of factors as to why that might be. Uh, one is that, that our political class is not reflective of general Australian society. Uh, it doesn't reflect our contemporary community. Um, secondly, we've seen the rise of a political class uh, which is developed from within. It doesn't reflect, it doesn't have a background in broader Australian society. They're apparatchiks largely. And I think that they uh, therefore have not had the exposure to Asia of other sectors of Australian society like business, universities, uh, even our military and our police, I think, uh, and parts of our bureaucracy. It's very difficult to shift those factors. Uh, I think there are some 
uh, institutional and policy settings which would assist. And I'd be interested, John or Hugh, if you think there are things that could help uh, give our political class greater exposure and understanding uh, of the region um, uh, to, to help correct this situation. In the meantime, I guess we should be grateful that at least some of our leaders do get it about Asia intellectually and even instinctively. And I should add that I think our foreign minister, our current foreign minister, got it uh, earlier from even before she became a politician. Thank you. Um, look, I'll just take the point on uh, the political class. Uh, I agree, and I think that's, you, you hear that view commonly expressed not only in the context of foreign policy, but in the context of domestic policy generally. I think it's a real challenge for this country, but uh, I'm not particularly qualified to make that comment. On, it's, I think, just, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> look, the other point I just think on, you know, how do you make the political class more aware, I think probably there are two things, uh, serious visits to Asia. But the thing that will count most will be indications from the leadership of the political parties that if you really want to get on, you have to understand the region. That will get a reaction out of the political class. Yes, if I just... Um well, I, I very much agree with the basic point you're making, Miles, and I just want to give a, a, a t t t tentative diagnosis of my own. I think there are two factors here which have led to a reduced quality of focus by Australian politicians on both sides of politics to the sorts of questions we're talking about. Um, one, one has to do with, the, with their experience. Um, if you look at the Prime Ministers, for example, all of Australia's Prime Ministers up to and including John Howard came of age politically during the Cold War in Asia in the 50s and 60s. They came of age in politically in an era where debates about Australian foreign and strategic policy were right at the heart of Australian politics. The more recent generation of Australian political leaders have come of age in an era which is actually in, past not just the end of the Cold War in Asia in 1972, but the end of the Cold War, full stop, in an era where foreign and strategic policy hardly counted. And that's not bad in a sense, was because we had a very stable, peaceful order and there wasn't too much work to do. There weren't big choices to be made. Now there are big choices to be made. These guys found themselves, find them, these people find themselves, um, I think, caught short. Uh, the, the second point, I, I guess, is one of, uh, you know, again goes back to my reflection on Whitlam, uh, on education, if I can put it that way. Um, it is very striking to me how people like Whitlam and Fraser and Hawke and Keating and Howard all were quite well read in history and knew quite, that not so much, they knew so much about Asia. They knew a fair bit about the world. And, and I do think their capacity to draw on history, think about these issues in a longer time frame, Whitlam of course being an extreme example, did, 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 did better fit them for the challenges they're facing, that they face, than um, the intellectual uh, furniture of our present generation of leaders seems to provide them. Thank you. Uh, next is um, Jeff Miller. Then we have that. You'd be the, if there's time, Alison, but we have two ahead of you. Jeff. Thanks very much, uh, Jeff Miller from the Sydney branch. Just like to comment that I think the point that. Uh, is that working? I, I don't think it's on. Sorry. Uh, I think that the point that we have to think for ourselves is particularly appropriate at the moment because if you look at both the US and China, I think neither of them are in particularly good shape. Uh, I was very struck uh, by the front cover of the latest issue of Foreign Affairs which uh, had on the cover, See America, Land of Decay and Dysfunction. And this is quite striking coming from the Council on Foreign Relations. And I think indeed the, um, the US public at the moment, it's reeling from the financial crisis and from the terrible wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, neither of which uh, seem to be likely to produce anything uh, desirable. In the case of China, I must say one gets the impression that the new regime is in a way curiously old-fashioned and that despite 
Xi Jinping's obvious abilities, he seems to be determined to impose uh, repressive and restrictive party rule on a population that's increasingly better educated, better informed, and is naturally very entrepreneurial and individualistic. So I think we can't really have enormous confidence in either regime, which brings us back to the point that Hugh made, we really have to think very hard for ourselves. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. If I could just, I mean, but basically agree, we've done this before, mate, but we basically agree with you by taking the contrary view. Um, and that is that, of course, both China and America have huge problems, but I guess what strikes me is not so much how many problems they have, but how bloody strong they both are. Um, uh, I mean, America, of course, the, the big challenge for America is not that its power is declining. I don't, think it, I don't believe it is in any absolute sense, but it, that it misunderstands where its power sits in the world. It, it still aspires assumes that it can play a role in the world, including in Asia, which it no longer has the power to do. And I think that affects what's going wrong in, not just in Asia, but in the Middle East and elsewhere as well. Uh, but, but it does remain fantastically strong. Uh, I do hope China doesn't underestimate it. Um, it has great depths of, of strength and, uh, and um, resilience. Um, it's just not as much as they think. Um, and likewise, although China does have huge problems, and the very interesting questions about where China goes from here, particularly under Xi Jinping, I don't think it would be sensible for us to make any plans about our own place in Asia or the way we see Asia evolving, evolving um, which didn't pay a lot of attention to the probability that China will not just overtake the United States to become the biggest economy in the world, but keep growing faster than the United States for a long time after that. Perfectly possible that within a few decades, time frames that are quite relevant, some of the choices we're making today, China's economy will be half as big or, 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 or twice as big as America's. Now, you know, for someone in my generation, that's almost unimaginable, but it does now seem to be a serious possibility. So certainly there are problems in both countries, but I think it's, it's their awesome strength which makes me most worried about what happens to the future of their relationship and how important that'll be for us. Thank you. Now, we do have two more questions that I can see. We're, we're virtually out of time because we're having the presentation of the Fellows Awards. So, um, Your Excellency um, and Alison, I'll try, if we could both try and make them quick questions and quick yes, answers uh, so we can keep to time. There we go, Ambassador of Argentina. Uh, for both uh, Hugh and John, the, uh, you mentioned both the question of this new bank, development bank that the Chinese are are promoting and uh, certainly when you go to the agenda of the G20 infrastructure is an essential thing precisely in this year and uh, uh, the, you, could, you could feel somehow there is some frustration in, in a lot of quarters and the way that the World Bank and the IMF has functioned the, the slow response to the, to the changes so that uh, it's not shouldn't be surprising anybody that the China and other countries are actually going ahead with that and probably most of the money needed for infrastructure will come from, from China anyhow. So the, the, I was a bit surprised by the position of the, that the papers are reflecting in Australia is not going to be a part of that because obviously if you have any sort of a, a doubt on which the way that you will take, probably it's best to be in. That's my, my gut feeling. Absolutely. I think it's a no-brainer, personally. And obviously some in the cabinet do too, <laughs> according to yeah. the press reports. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, you know, China, China has the money. Um, the, the, the other international financial institutions in Asia don't have a very good reputation. China does have experience in engineering the most amazing explosion infrastructure in its own country in history. Um, uh, uh, but, of course, China will run the bank as much as it can according to China's rules and to suit China's interests. Gosh, fancy running an international financial institution on that basis. How shocking. And this will challenge American leadership in Asia, which is why America opposes it. If, if, you're, if you're in Washington and your objective is to preserve US primacy as a foundation for the Asian order, you're right to oppose the AIIB. But that shows that that's a dumb objective for America to set out to, set out to achieve. Thank you. Um, Alison, final question. My question 
is rhetorical in effect because it's really for Senator Mason who isn't here to hear it. How is it, I would ask him, that the Abbott in opposition, uh, the Abbott government, when in opposition, opposed our, bill for the, our bid for the Security Council, saying it was a waste of money, is now taking credit for our performance there, and yet the, the slogan with which we ran that bid was, we do what we say. Now, in fact, in spite of what he told you this morning, we have not done what we said. We have, for instance, immediately we got into the Security Council, reduced our aid, which we had increased before in order to get the seat. We have lost contact with the countries we, we first said were so important to our people, particularly Alison, South I'm sorry to be rude, but I, I appreciate your question, but we are running out of time because Richard okay. Miles will be arriving. So and finally, we, we have received a lot of criticism from the United Nations on our treatment of, of refugees and other things. And so for us to just bask in being a top 20 nation in the Security Council is a little gratuitous, I think.